judging by how many there are in the Gospels, we can rightly conclude that parables were one of Jesus' favorite ways to teach the people. He used these parables to tell the truth of God so that the common person could understand what the kingdom was all about. And this is in sharp contrast to the scribes and the Pharisees, because they tended to teach in a, what do I want to say, a highfalutin scholarly kind of way, because they're always so much better than everybody else. They talked in terms of law, they talked in terms of rules, they talked in terms of rituals that you had to do, and the common people just couldn't quite grasp how that all related to them. Jesus, however, wanted the people to understand the truth of the kingdom. And so he talked at the level of an everyday person like you and like me. He told stories. Now, you have to work with these stories. If you are willing to wrestle with it and dig deep into it and kind of try to figure it out, you're going to find some real nuggets of gold about the kingdom of God. But if you're not willing to do the work and you don't want to take that kind of time and effort, you're not going to find much in these stories at all. Most parables are easily understood, but some, like this one, need some explanation. And wow, do we have a great advantage because the apostles were kind enough to write down not just the parables, but all of the meanings of the parables that Jesus told them. Isn't that lovely? And so here we have the secrets to the kingdom of God. And in the four Gospels, the parable of the sower, as it is usually known, some call it the parable of the soils because that's where the point of difference occurs. But this parable is always first. Uh, now, I, I want you to imagine, it says that Jesus is on the shoreline and a crowd is gathering, so he gets in a boat, boat pulls out a little bit so he can speak to the entire crowd. You are there in the crowd, ready to listen to Jesus preach, and this is what he says. Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, or even a hundred times. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, when you hear that just off the page, do you get anything out of it? You know, I kind of think about the friend who's inviting another friend. You know, there's this guy named Jesus. He's a great preacher. He's teaching. He's doing miracles. He's going to be down at the beach. Why don't you come with me and hear him, right? And so he comes down to the beach and, and he hears Jesus tell this parable. I, I just get the sense he looks at his friend and he's like, really? This is great preaching? A story about a farmer? I don't get anything out of that. And I don't think that person is alone. Because even the disciples, when they come into the room, say, what was that about? What were you talking about? What is the meaning of this parable? And so some are confused, and thankfully the disciples wrote down everything that Jesus said here. And when, when they come in and ask that, Jesus says, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. I like that first line. The secrets of the kingdom of God are given to you. And thank you, Jesus, that your apostles didn't keep them a secret. They wrote them down. Amen. Amen. 
They wrote them down so that we could understand. Don't you like to be in on a secret? You know? And what's the hardest thing? Yeah. Keeping the secret. Guess what? You don't have to keep this secret. <coughs> this is a secret that you get to tell everybody. Amen. Hallelujah. So don't keep it in. That's actually the wrong thing to do with this secret. Let it out. Tell everybody you can. But these secrets are hidden in these parables. And he says, listen. Listen. Uh, let's see. In another, in another gospel, he says, those who have ears, if they listen, they will gain more. And those who don't hear and don't act on what they say, they will lose even what they have. And so it is important to wrestle with these parables. It is important to dig into them. It is important to understand their meaning. And if you will work at it, you will get something out of it. But if you're not willing to work, again, if you're not willing to dig, you're not going to get anything. You're not going to find the secret of the parable. We know people like that, don't we? Who knew the secret. They came to church, they were here for a while, they did some things, but they're not here anymore. They're not going anywhere. What happened? Well, this parable is going to tell us a little bit about that kind of person. And so the secret of the kingdom of God is in the parable. Jesus says what, uh, what we are seeing and hearing are things that the Old Testament prophets wanted to know. And he says here, the Jews of his day are going to be kind of left in the dark. They will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. And that's not God's judgment, I don't think. Because if it was real judgment on the Jews, Jesus would never have come to them in the first place. Rather, it has to do with the fact that the Jews have a history of refusing... Yeah, it is frustrating. It's all good. I'll try and work it in if I can. <laughs> but the Jews have a history of not listening to God's prophets. And at that point, God says in this psalm where this is taken from, actually Isaiah, you know, I've been talking to you all this time. You haven't been listening, so I'm going to start hiding it in parables. Now, there is a balance to that in Matthew's passage about this parable. Because just after this, Jesus quotes a psalm where God says, I will reveal everything through parables. So parables serve a dual purpose for those who are on the outside, and especially the enemies of Jesus, like the scribes and the Pharisees. And, you know, if he taught something overtly subversive, they would arrest him on the moment. But if he puts it in the terms of a parable story, now it's hidden from them. The Pharisees and the scribes are going to go away. We don't need to worry about him. He's just talking about farmers and seeds. Who cares? But the people on the inside, the people who want to know, the disciples who are willing to come and ask Jesus, what did you mean? He will tell them those secrets. And so, they can reveal and they can hide. But we need to be the ones who need to see with our eyes and hear with our ears. And we need to put these things into action. We need to be obedient to the teaching that Jesus gives us. So, what's the secret? Verse 13. Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among the thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like the seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. Now, once Jesus explains it, don't you go... Aha! That makes perfect sense. Well, of course. And when we look at the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of the church, we see this parable being lived out all the time, don't we? The farmer sows the word. The seed is the word. The word of God. The message of Jesus. And the seed never changes. It is the gospel that the church has been proclaiming 
for just about 2,000 years at this point. All have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, especially eternal death in the lake of fire. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the way we get that eternal life is because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He is the atonement that takes away our sin. And if we will put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our sins will be forgiven and we will be saved. That is the seed. And all of us should be sowing that seed every day. In the parable, obviously, the farmer is Jesus, the first one to sow the seed of the message of the kingdom. But since Jesus ascended and sat down at the right hand of the Father, that sowing mission has been given to the church of Jesus Christ in every generation. We are the ones who sow the seed of the gospel. And I think in every generation, we can find these four types of soil. Soil number one, the person who is hard of heart, who has no mind, no spirit, no inclination, no heart for spiritual things. They don't care about God. They don't care about Jesus. They don't care about religion. They just want to live for themselves. And so the word cannot penetrate and sooner or later, the devil comes along, takes away what little they have, and they forget what they heard. We know people like that, don't we? Unfortunately. So we have that kind of soil in our world. Soil number two is the rocky soil. There's a little bit of soil there, but there's a lot of rocks in it. This is the person who, I'll, I'll say, is the person of the religion of convenience. Well, sure, I'll put my faith in Jesus. That sounds good. But Jesus says when persecution comes along, they wither. You know, well, I'll be a Christian as long as it doesn't cause me any problems, as long as it's not a problem at work, doesn't cause me any problems at home, as long as I don't have to make any sacrifices, as long as it's convenient and I don't have to be troubled, sure, I'll be a Christian. How long does that last? Jesus says in John 14, you will have tribulation. So sooner or later, something's going to come along to test your faith. And because they don't have deep root, these people wither. They, they kind of say, well, I'm not, I don't need this. If it's not going to be convenient, I'm just going to let that go. We know people like that, unfortunately, don't we? Soil number three. The person who looks on the things of this life and gets wrapped up in them. They want faith and the world at the same time. And John says the two are incompatible. The purpose of the seed to the farmer is that it will take root and produce a crop. The purpose of the gospel is that it will take root in us and will make disciples. And I want to make a distinction there. Not just believers. Yes, I like believers. Because I like you. But I want more for you than to be just a believer. We need to be a disciple. That's what this is talking about. That the roots go down deep and we really commit ourselves to Jesus and living for Him. That is the purpose of the gospel, to make disciples. That's the purpose of the church in Matthew 28. Go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. Not just believers but disciples. And so, these are those who want to have the world, um, but just as weeds choke out the wheat, focusing on the world and all its cool stuff, will choke out the fruit of discipleship. And when I think about the church in America, this is the place where we need to be very vigilant, because God has blessed this nation. And we have a lot of cool stuff, don't we? There are so many distractions in this country. Mm -hmm. And we can easily follow the worldly system that America has developed. You know, go to work and get your money and live the American dream. And, get, and then sometimes I think we put the American dream over becoming a true disciple of Christ. And it chokes out the fruit. Mm -hmm. And so church attendance becomes sporadic. Well, I've come to church, but I've got to work. Well, I've come to church, but... 
oh, I've got something else I want to do, or this is too much fun. I've got to do, the, you know, I'm the pastor. I'm sorry. I have to kind of come up with those things. It chokes out the fruit. I can't serve. It doesn't fit into my schedule. Giving becomes kind of a token to God because that flat screen over in the Best Buy just looks really cool. <laughs> And we want fellowship with the internet or social media more than we want to gather and talk to each other mm. in person. Amen. Remember when that used to happen. Put your phones away sometimes. And I'm, I'm guilty sometimes too. I believe as American Christians, this is where we need constant vigilance. Because the weeds of the American dream can easily choke out the discipleship that Jesus wants for us in our lives. Amen. And so, focus more on being real disciples than on being real Americans. I know that sounds a little unpatriotic, but we are citizens of the kingdom first and America second. So our focus is to be on being real disciples. And we know people who are consumed by the world, don't we? And, you know, yeah, they're Christian, yeah, they believe, but they're just more focused on what they can get out there than what they can get in here. And what's in here is far more valuable. At least one person agrees with you. Thank you. <laughs> Soil number four. The good dirt. The fruitful dirt. The productive dirt. The seed gets planted in that. It takes deep root and it brings forth a harvest. 30, 60, or 100 fold. This is the person that not only believes, but they let the word of God sink in. It takes root and they go out and live it day to day, every day. And as they go out and live it, they become real disciples. And you want to know the irony of this? That I think, as in my observation, the people who really dive into Jesus and let that root take, uh, take root, they become more prosperous and blessed than the person who's trying to chase all the things of the world. Mm. Mm? Because that's the promise of God in our lives. And so... They bear the fruit. And I think there's two kinds of fruit there. First, the fruit of the Spirit. Because the Spirit is in our lives helping us to live uh, in the image of Jesus Christ. And so we bear His character. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. We are the image of Christ. And as we put our roots down into Jesus, His life comes up into our lives. And Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. No one can bear fruit unless you stay connected to me. And so our job is just to stay connected to Jesus. His job through the power of the Spirit is to bear the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And so certainly we are to be bearing the fruit of the Spirit. The second thing is we're supposed to be bringing in more disciples. We're supposed to be sowing the Word and getting the gospel out there so that there will be disciples in the church. I think that's part of bearing fruit too. Now, I'll get to that in just a second. Well, maybe I'll get to it right now. Um, but these people of the good dirt have found the secret to living the victorious Christian life in the power of the Holy Spirit. How do you do that? Let the Word of God dwell in you richly as you admonish each other in psalms and songs and spiritual songs. Let the Word of God take root in you. Let the life of Jesus take root in you. And He will bear the fruit in your life. Amen. They found the secret. But we ought to take another look at that farmer. Initially Jesus and now us. You know, all He did and, and in, in the process of farming, this kind of farming and that kind of all he did was walk along his land and throw the seed everywhere. Didn't, didn't even worry about where it was going. Just threw the seed everywhere. I think that's our preaching mission. Jesus brought the gospel to everyone. He did not, he did not pick and choose. He did not discriminate. He did not exclude. And we are not to exclude. The gospel is for every person of every race, every gender, every education level, every age level. We are not to discriminate in the preaching of the gospel. Throw the seed everywhere in which every which way you can. Through prayer, through witness. Put down a tract. How, 
what if get the gospel out there? And once the farmer threw all this seed out there, then what did he do? Water. He went home. <laughs> he didn't even water it. Not according to the parable, did it? <laughs> he went home. And I think that's it. He didn't worry about it. He didn't think about it. He didn't go out and check it every day. He was going to wait until harvest. He went out and sowed the seed. He came home and he trusted God for the harvest. He trusted God to bring the water. He trusted God to bring the sunshine and whatever else that needed so that that crop would take root. And I believe as we go out and sow the seed, go out and preach the gospel, come home and relax. Don't worry about it. In Corinthians, Paul says it's God's job to water it. It's God's job to make it grow. Certainly, I would pray for the people that we want to be saved. But it's God's job. We are only responsible to get the gospel out there. Any results are on God, not on us. We cannot force people into conversion. We cannot make people get saved. All we can do is show them the great love of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for us and that the great forgiveness and eternal life is available to them. And then we've just got to trust the Spirit that He'll bring conviction of sin and judgment and righteousness. He will tear down whatever blinders are there. He will help them to understand because that's what happened to us, isn't it? We need to be faithful like the farmer to just go out and spread the gospel. And some seed will produce results. Hallelujah. We like results. But I think this parable also says, some will not. And that makes me sad. Sometimes it makes me frustrated. But it makes me sad. But not everyone who heard Jesus put their faith in Him, did they? And if they didn't put their faith in Jesus when he was here live and in color and in person, then how much more difficult is it when they see us, who are obviously not Jesus, but telling them this word. But God can break through. He broke through to us. He can break through to anybody. And so we need to keep preaching, keep praying, and keep working so that God can bring those to harvest, those whom he has brought to harvest. Our duty in this job is to preach the Preach the gospel. After that, it's God's problem. Hallelujah. We have one other job. It's the same job I told the kids. Be the best dirty Christian you can be. Don't be the hard path that doesn't let the word take root. Don't be the rocky soil, the religion of convenience, because I'm just going to tell you now, you're going to have problems and trials and tribulation and hassle. If you haven't already, stay tuned. They're on the next train. Alright? But, stay faithful to Jesus. And don't let the weeds of the world choke you out. Amen. Stay focused on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Be that fourth soil. Let the Word of God get into you. Come to church. Come to Sunday school. Do your daily Bible reading. Get into a Bible study find a book or whatever, keep learning about Jesus so that His life becomes your life. And when that happens, you will produce the fruit that God wants in your life because you're staying connected to Him. That's the promise. If you stay connected to me, you will bear fruit. Again, we almost don't have to worry about it. I would say make some effort. But the fruit of the Spirit and the Christian life is not about what I do. It's about what Jesus does in me as I yield to Him. And so be the best dirty Christian you can be. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for telling us the secret through the apostles who were kind enough to write this down. We understand, Lord, because you have explained it. Lord, our prayer, first of all, is that you will indeed help us to be the best dirt. The dirt that produces fruit at the highest possible level. Bless your word, your teaching, your love, your power to take root in us and bear the fruit that only you can bear. And Lord, we pray for the fruit of more disciples. Help us to be faithful to sow the word of the gospel every place we can. 
And we're going to just, we know, Lord, that's it. And then after that, we've got to trust you and we pray you will water those souls. You will bring the sunshine on those souls. You will break down the walls and the barriers and the blinders. And you will bring them to faith in your own time and along your own way. Lord, grant us a heart. Lord, we give this time to you. We pray you would speak to us where we are and move us to where we need to be. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. What kind of dirt are you? Your dirt number one, break up that fallow ground. Break up that hard ground. Let the Word of God come into you. Put your faith in Jesus now. All right, now. Now. And be saved. Are you dirt number two? Are you the religion of convenience? Get rid of those rocks. Get rid of those rocks and say you will trust in Jesus no matter what comes. Are you dirt number three? What's choking you out? Get rid of that thing and let God produce the fruit of discipleship in you. Are you dirt number four? Are you producing at the level you want and Jesus wants? Do you want to be more? Today's the day to recommit your life to Him. Whatever is your need, Jesus is here in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring you the answer you need. And I'll be glad to pray with you at the front as we sing our hymn of commitment. Brother Beer.